Hi, my name is Henry Lee, and with my, my fellow student Will Palmer at Wilson High School, Portland, Oregon, we designed a stellar model called Milk Models. And basically, it models what, it's, what our model does is it proves that the transportation of goods and commodities, which is a, a direct result from globalization, ends up in more CO2 in the atmosphere. And you say, why should I care about this? And the answer is that you should care because we've all heard about global warming. And we've also all heard about the causes of global warming, whether it's car emissions, the burning of fossil fuels, or poor building designs. But one of the least told and tragic stories regarding global warming is the transportation of food and goods across the world. And the Penguin Atlas of Food, and I quote directly from it, says that trade-related transportation is one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse gas emissions. But because emissions resulting from international air and sea freight are not included in national inventories, such as the Kyoto Protocol, there is no incentive for them to be reduced. And I have some reference graphs. The first is for transportation of goods and food across the world. As the world globalizes, shipping and free trade have become the norm. As more and more goods are shipped, CO2 emissions will also increase which is the graph on the bottom. Humans have emitted more and more CO2 in the past years. This needs to be stopped if global warming is to be reliably halted. And for my model, this is the actual model. Um, you can see the first section that we put was the US population because we're modeling the, the situation inside the US it was necessary to put a U.S. population section first. And the next one is the um, domestic milk production section. Um, a stock represents the total amount of milk produced slash available in the U.S. Um, there is an inflow called production and there are two outflows, the exports and U.S. consumption. Um, for this model, I assume that the U.S. exported all of the milk that wasn't consumed, and that was a major assumption. And for the production, um, you'll see one of the most important um, objects here is the production capacity, which I will talk about more later. But what it does, it, it puts a limit on the amount of milk that can be produced in the U.S. It sets a cap because Logically, the U.S. can't produce infinite amounts of milk. There's a limit. Next section is imported milk, and you can see how it ties in with the other two sections. U.S. population goes into average amount of milk used, and that which is um, the, this um, product of the percent of the population that use milk, the U.S. population, and the amount of milk used per person. And um, imported milk um, is represented by a stock with a flow called imports and an outflow called milk used. Imports is a product of the actual import rate and the amount of milk left over from consumption. And the next part is um, what I like to think that's the most important part because it gets to the root of why we are doing this model in the first place, and that's the CO2 emissions from milk transportation. And using the most up-to-date data that we could find, um, you can see that we found that um, we used the penguin atlas of food to find the average carbon dioxide emissions from milk transportation by plane, truck, and ship, and average the three values. And um, get rid of this here. The final graphs, this is what we came up with. As you can see, 
number four represents U.S. consumption. And U.S. consumption, because the U.S. population is rising, the consumption is rising along with it in this nice linear growth we have here. And um, as numbers, the number three curve, which is right here, represents U.S. production of milk. And it goes up along with consumption and demand. But when it reaches production capacity, you'll find that down here for imports, the imports soar because there is a demand for milk, but there isn't enough milk being produced in the U.S., so the country has no option but to import from other countries. And this results in a meteoric rise in the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which is represented here by graph number two. Um, right here, you can see its sharp growth. And I want to talk about one of our most important feedback loops. It's a counteracting um, feedback loop, a balancing one. And it says that if the CO2 emissions from milk transportation goes up, then a whole chain of events will lead to ultimately the CO2 emitted going down again. And this is an optimistic situation. And it's obviously not happening right now because humans are aware that there is this global warming situation, but we're not act actively doing, taking any serious steps to reduce um, our CO2 emissions. But this is, in a utopian society, this is what would happen. Um, the imports rate would go down, imports would go down, the total amount of milk that is moving would go down, the CO2 emitted would go down, and then the total CO2 emissions would go down because we'd be aware of this problem. And um, to get back to my PowerPoint presentation. Oops. Let's skip through all this. Sorry. It's OK. And the root of the problem, ultimately what I think is one of the major causes is population growth. Population growth coupled with the consumption, the amount of resources that most Americans use. Americans use up to 10 times more resources than the average person living in India. But couple that with population growth, and we have a serious problem because we're putting too much demand on the earth. As was, as was the case in our model, sooner or later the US will reach a production capacity of milk, forcing the country to start importing from other countries. And that results in demand and population growth ultimately. And what I learned, from, what I'm more adapt with using Sela, the software I more skill now that now that I have more experience with it, but I'm also more aware of the negative impacts of globalization. Globalization is a term that I've heard many times, and whether it's knocking down barriers to free trade or something, but I've generally heard only the good stuff. You know, we get these cheap products from countries like China and whatever, whatever, but there are negative impacts too. And I'm just more aware of the issue now. And the third one and last one right now is that I've urged my parents to do this, but it's to buy local food, not processed or imported. Not only is local food generally more nutritious, but it also helps to sustain your local community and to balance the local economy better. And processed slash imported food isn't generally it's not as good for the environment as local food because the amount of fossil fuels it takes to make the packaging, to transport it from whatever place to my plate, whatever, whatever, it's just not as good as local food. Thank you.